Okay, well, in the spirit of the previous talk, I will open by saying that I'm not Roman Vishnu. My, my name is Andreas Kipri, and I'm here to present uh, an IMS medallion to Roman. So I want to say a few words about Roman before we start his lecture. So Roman is a professor right now, a professor of mathematics at the University of California, Irvine. Um, he is an associate director there of the Center for Algorithms, Combinatorics and Optimization. And his research is uh, very much about the foundations of the mathematical foundations of deep learning. It spans high dimensional probability. Mathematical data science in particular is, is uh, a topic that we are all very keen to get more uh, insight into the theoretical depth of that. And I think Roman is already ahead of the game in that respect. Um, he's published around 80 papers, and but many of these are in very, very heavy duty mathematical journals. Um, and he's an author of a CUP textbook, which I, I didn't check if it's out there. Is it out? It's out there. You can see it. It's called High Dimensional Probability. Um, and this book, actually, he won the, the Prose Award for Mathematics uh, from the Association of American Publishers. For this. Um, I was rooting around in Roman's CV and I discovered he's had about 19 fellowships and, and grants. And these include, for example, the Sloan Research Fellowship and the Bessel Research Award from the Humboldt Foundation. So highly decorated. Um, recently, Roman was part of a group of 11 PIs who obtained quite a big NSF grant, about $10 million, to look at the scientific foundations of deep learning. And we'll certainly hear more about that today. Um, so you can really see how uh, Roman's career is really progressing um, into an area where I think we all agree we need much more uh, uh, mathematical input. So I'm very excited to hear what he has to say today. And just a little bit about Roman himself. Um, so he's originally from Ukraine. Uh, he studied at, this is going to be difficult to say, Zaporizhia. <laughs> University in Kharkiv uh, University, of course, two places we hear a lot about recently, and then moved to the US, to the University of Missouri, um, Columbia, and, and got his PhD in 2000. Uh, since then, before uh, going to UC Irvine, where he is now, he's had positions at uh, University of Michigan, uh, UC Davis, Alberta in Canada, and the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Okay, so each year the IMS nominates eight medallion lectures in fields across the IMS, uh, uh, subject, the subject range that the IMS covers. So the award of a medallion signals the honor inherent in being selected to give one of these lectures. And so today I would like to present Roman with an IMS medallion and invite him to present his lecture on privacy, probability, and synthetic data. So there will be a little photo first. So here we are. Here we are. You may now speak. <laughs> Quick one more. Would you like to mark down that one? Uh, thank you very much, Roman. Yes, thank you so much, Alexander, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, IMS, for this. This is a big honor for me and a big pleasure to be to be here. Thank you all for, for coming to this lecture. Um, this is something new. I would like to speak about something new that uh, that me and my colleagues 
Thomas Schrommer and March Bodiharjo dived in recently. This work is joined with them and then supported by NSF, NH, GA, all other three letter agencies except TIA. <laughs> Um, and this is about privacy and synthetic data. So as a, as a milestone example uh, of where we really need some mathematical input in this area is, is the intensive health, intensive care unit in hospitals. This is one of the most data driven clinical environments. And the, the data analysis approaches that we have now, they are tailored, they need to be tailored to specific needs of the UCI, to the IC. But the problem is that there is a lack of availability and access to sufficient data. And this is the main roadblock for medical experts, and data scientists. The reason is that the hospitals, they are unwilling or, or unable to share sensitive data about patients um, to third parties, to, for example, to statisticians. It's, it's really a big hurdle to, to obtain the data from them because privacy needs to be protected. So a new idea uh, emerged is to, instead of trying to convince them that to release synthetic data, to release something fake, to release to statisticians uh, synthetic data rather than uh, true patients. That would be tremendously helpful to break this data bottleneck and, and satisfy privacy laws because synthetic data is not real, so you can share it. You can share artificial fake patients without breaching any any privacy. Privacy itself is very important. It's just in the Declaration of Human Rights and so on and so forth. But data sharing is a problem. So trusting Google, Facebook, and, and other companies with privacy is like tr trusting the oil giants with environmental regulations. We cannot do that. So how do we how do we solve this problem? The main, the big goal is to build machine learning, uh, to build stati statistics around privacy. Um, so privacy preserving machine learning, that would be the key word, which would satisfy two, two, um, two desiderata. One is usefulness, one is privacy itself, and the other is usefulness. The data that we have should be, should be uh, useful for model development. There are many approaches currently that are trying to achieve these two goals. Two of them are differential differential privacy, one of the most known one, and the other is the new one is trying to use synthetic data um, to mitigate uh, the, the short shortcomings of, of differential privacy and other other methods. I will mostly talk about differential privacy today, and there are two. There is there is kind of a general mathematical way to quantify what we really need. We need to define privacy uh, and we need to define usefulness or utility. This is the two desiderata that the data should have. And here is here is a, we'll start with privacy. The, for the privacy, there are two main, two simplest ways to define uh, security and privacy. One is easy, uh, it's called anonymity. And the other is harder, differential privacy. Anonymity is kind of weak, that's why we start. So it's easy, can anonymity. What, what's anonymity? Let's say I take true patients and I release synthetic patients and the data, synthetic data is K and is called K anonymous. If each individual, each true uh, person cannot be distinguished from at least K individuals in the data. Okay, so think about just grouping K peoples, group of K peoples and creating one person out of K. Of, of this group, from each group, one person. That will be K-anonymous, because from that person, you would not probably be able to tell which exactly person you are, you're creating it from. The mathematical definition of this is very simple. It's just X is the true data, Y is the synthetic data, and the algorithm is K-anonymous if the pre-image of every synthetic patient is, uh, has cardinality at least K, or at least K individuals is indistinguishable from. <laughs> And here's how you achieve it. This is maybe you take a, a, a table uh, of, of, of true patients. And then in this particular table, I just hide, I mask some of the entries. And you, you can see, for example, that the first and the fourth row, the, sorry, the first and, 
and the third rows are identical, and uh, the second and the fourth rows are identical. So this is too anonymous. K anonymity is very simple, it's a very popular standard, but privacy guarantees are limited uh, for K anonymity. With a little bit of site information, you can you can generate, you can breach the, uh, the privacy of this. And so a new idea, newer uh, idea, newer definition was proposed around 2006 by, by Cynthia at work and others, and that's called differential privacy. It's a randomized notion. Um, a randomized algorithm, A, that takes true data to synthetic data is differentially private. If you would not be able to tell even with high probability, you would not be able to tell with high probability whether each individual person was there to create synthetic data or not. So if we say have a group of people here and I create synthetic data, then with high probability, I should not be able to tell whether, say, Alexander was there or not there. The synthetic data with high probability should be absolutely the same. So not only do you do not know any, you would not need, sorry, not only you cannot know any information about Alexander, you do not even know whether he was or was not in the, in the data set. So that's a very strong notion. The, Formal definition is here. So randomized is epsilon differential private and epsilon is a number, hopefully a small number near zero. If for any, if for any pair of databases, X1 and X2, those are the true patients, sorry, the true, uh, the true patient sets, X1 and X2, that differ on at most one element. So I just include Alexander, right? X is Alexander. If for any two, um, two databases that differ in at most one element, the algorithm's distribution, the output's distribution is about the same. So the probability that the synthetic data set is an S, wherever that S is, think about as a query, let's say I'm asking, are there, you know, what, what's, what's an average salary, for example, of this? Is it between like, I don't know, 80 and 100 something. For any query like this, the algorithm will, the probability will be about the same of answering it. The probability, if you divide, let's say the probability is ideally it will be the same, but they can't be. And so there is an error. The error is quantified by epsilon. Smaller than epsilon, e to the epsilon will be closer to one, but the closer will be the left and right hand side. It's in some in, in a spirit that is similar to robust statistics in a sense, because we're saying that the output is the output of this algorithm is robust to any outlier. I can change one patient, one 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 element in an arbitrary way. And the, the output is still about the same. For statisticians and for probability people, for probabilists like me. Uh, this definition is interesting and challenging. It really challenges us because as you can see, the error is multiplicative, it's not additive. If it were additive, then I would be able to discard as we usually do uh, exponentially small sets. So I'll, I'll apply the usual technique of probability. Some exponent, some concentration inequality. And then I say, well, in a small probability, small, part of the probability space, everything is bad, but it is so small that I, I, I can forget about it. Well, here I cannot forget about any, even exponentially small, even, even exponentially rare events because, of, because the error is multiplicative. And so it forces us to think about exponentially rare events too. Okay, good. So that's a definition, that's it. Differential, Privacy is, is a relatively strong notion, and it was used already, and it's, it's been being tried in many applications, many companies do it, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Um, without much, I, I guess there wasn't a resounding success. And the, uh, for example, to create uh, um, uh, realistically looking, um, realistically looking data, 
Apple, I think Apple and Google, uh, they they tried this, but with epsilon being about 100, I think that's that becomes realistic. And e to the epsilon is e to the 100. So that's <laughs> that's more than the number of particles in the universe. Um, yeah. U.S. government released U.S. Census in 2020, and that's with with a much better epsilon, with epsilon being I think one, which is, which is better. How do you achieve differential privacy? Well, you can always achieve differential privacy if you return white noise or junk, almost differential private. But uh, usually, you interpolate between releasing true data and total junk by just adding some noise on top of the data, and that's mo most of the methods of differential privacy are based on something like this by adding noise. So our goal is, is to release differentially private and a useful synthetic data. Take the true patients and release fake patients. There need to be two, two sub-goals, two, two desiderata here. One is that the, the true and synthetic data need to be globally similar so that they can maintain the, the useful statistics of the data. For example, if you can think of the average or covariances or something like this. This is a global parameter. They need to be similar. But locally, they have to be different. In order to protect individuals' and information, I would not be able to tell whether each individual person is there or not. So, so locally, they should be different, but globally similar. How can you create something like this? There are two extremes. One, on, on, on the one end, you, you may release the original data. Uh, the privacy will be zero, no privacy at all, but perfect utility, the original data. The other end, you can release something like a junk, like a white noise. The synthetic data is random, so it will be perfect privacy. No information will be shared about the true data, but zero utility. And hopefully there is some, we do not know that actually, this is a very interesting thing. If, is there some something like information theoretical trade-off, privacy utility trade-off. What is this curve? What, what does it even mean? Is there something like a curve that, that says, okay, this is, this is what you can achieve theoretically and this is what you can achieve computation. We don't really have that. So this is this is a goal. Understand this, this law, privacy utility trade-off. Um, this is kind of a picture that I have in mind when I think about privacy and canonymity how how this is achieved right so anonymity can be achieved by maybe masking information so that when you put a mask on, on top of the eyes then you cannot distinguish one person from the other and that's that's anonymity differential privacy is by adding noise so you kind of blur things and the there's a hope that maybe there is a better way with synthetic data with something like generative models we don't have that but Maybe there is a there is a better way for synthetic data generation just to generate new people from the old people, the people that do not exist really, so they don't appear either masked or blurred. They they appear like true people, but they they're not there. They they don't exist, and so privacy would be still upheld. So we we don't have that result, and that will be very interesting to achieve. But today we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about mathematics, what we can achieve. Um, how can we how can we achieve this mathematically will be explained in a very simple model, very baby model of mathematics, which is a discrete cube. So I assume that our true data is is a Boolean data. So assume you just have maybe patients with Boolean parameters. Um, so X is a true data, has P parameters, and there's N patients. Most people parameters. So maybe you can think of this uh, n rows and p the matrix with n rows and p columns, and it may represent electronic health records, for example, of n patients, each having p binary entries, such as small, non small diabetes, no diabetes, COVID, no COVID. Or maybe it can represent census data of n people, each having p binary entries, single or married. So the binary restriction is not is not very necessary in this, but we'll just stick to it for the sake of simplicity for this talk. So I assume we have this data and this is our true data and we would like to generate a synthetic data which is private, private and accurate. 
Well, what's accurate? Privacy, we already know what it is. It's differential privacy or anonymity. But what's accurate? accuracy? How do we define it? One way to do this is to, to ask that the useful statistics are preserved. And useful statistics are the mean, of course, it's one dimensional marginal, it's a mean, or two dimensional marginal, such as covariances, uh, or three dimensional marginals of this Boolean cube. There will be three way interactions. For example, how many patients smoke and have diabetes and coffee, there will be three way margin, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we would like to preserve things like that low dimensional marginals, one dimensional mean, two dimensional covariance, variances, covariances, and three dimensional. So Okay, so that's that's a goal. We would like to release differentially private data that preserves these marginals. Let's say up to marginal 10. Okay, right. We're gaining we're narrowing down to, to specific mathematical uh, conjecture. So we would like to design a randomized algorithm that inputs the true data, so endpoints in the discrete in the Boolean cube, and outputs the data that is first synthetic data, so it needs to output in the same domain. The patients will be M points in the same domain, William cube, needs to be private, differentially private, needs to be accurate. Uh, so low dimensional marginals, let's say after the marginal 10, uh, will be closed between this true and synthetic data. And it needs to be efficient, it needs run runtime polynomial in NFP, for example. So it's the minimal, minimal assumptions that you can have about this problem, I think. Now, the, they, now we hit the first roadblock. This is impossible. So in the theorem, um, Ullman and Vadan, 2011, they proved that this is, this is an impossible goal, meaning that there is some fine print to this, but assuming the existence of one-way functions, which is a standard assumption in theory of computer science, this is NP hard in NP. You can't really have synthetic data like that. And that this is this this result was this result I think discouraged people in 2011 going forward, discouraged them from trying even to, to see what, what's possible. Because even if you in fact it, it's impossible even to preserve uh, two-dimensional marginals. That's what they prove. Not even three dimensional. Mm -hmm. So even covariances are impossible to preserve. And that's that's really discouraging in some way because if you cannot really preserve covariances, then what this is good for? You cannot even do the SVD or PCA or something like this. What, what, what good is it about the synthetic? So this this discouraged people from looking into this problem further, um, at least on the theory side. And uh, fortunately for us, we did not know about this result when we started working. So so we pushed hard against the impossible until we discovered something that that is possible actually not of course contradicting this but something something else something interesting um, and so this i will talk about the three results which in each of the three ways overcome go around this, this impossibility result first woman and vadan result is a worst case result when we when we say it's np hard here this is impossible we mean that there exists very very bad data for which it is impossible. But in statistics, we don't have, we, we don't usually deal with the worst possible data. We deal the data with the data that comes from some distribution and that distribution is probably not as bad as, as the worst case result. So for, we prove that for everything is okay for the typical data that, that's sampled from some nice distribution. I will not talk about this one, but I will talk about the, the second and third wave of going around with this. Second wave is everything is okay for most marginals no, instead of all marginals. Woman and Badan results says you cannot preserve all possible all covariances. And there is like p square covariance, so p p parameters, so p square covariance. You cannot preserve all of them, but we prove that we can preserve 99% of them. So 0.99 times p squared. That that we can do. Um, and the third result is Ullman and Vadan result is NP hard in N and P, where P is a dimension. And we prove that it's, everything is okay for low dimensional data. So if P is fixed, then if the dimension is fixed, then everything is okay. Right. So there are three, three ways 
that you can overcome this and we will we'll talk about number two and number three. Okay, so a little bit of math, how, how do we actually define this margin? The true data, the true data are n patients in this Boolean cube, right? But it's, it's a little bit easier, a little bit simpler here to think about the random vector that's uniformly distributed in these patients rather than individual patients. That will come handy when we think about about empirical means and stuff like that. So we think about the true data as a random vector that just picks a random patients. Okay. So the two dimensional marginals, for example, the number of patients who smoke and have diabetes are, is just a fraction of these marginals. It's, it's, so we, we, we take the product of them, X1, let's say one is smoke, the two, parameter two has diabetes, multiply them. Remember there is zero ones, so one will only be triggered when it's in both at once. And so number of people who smoke and have diabetes is sum of x of one times x of two. And then we interpret this, the sum, the normalized sum as expectation of this random vector. And our goal is to have the expectations close between the, the, the expectation of the true data, close expectations in the data. Okay. So e of x1, x2 is close to e of y1, y2, where y is, of course, the run the vector that's uniformly distributed on the synthetic. So in the matrix form, if you if you want to talk about all marginals, you just put all this all these covariances together, you get a matrix, you get a covariance matrix, second moment matrix. Expected value of x, x transpose. And Ullman and Vadan theorem, no go theorem, says that there is no polynomial time algorithm to generate a private synthetic data for which all marginals are closed simultaneously, like the worst case marginal. And to do this, you look at these two matrices, you look at the errors, the difference between them, and you take the infinity of the soup norm, measuring the worst possible of the p-square errors. So this is impossible. Okay. That's impossible. Wait, okay. what is possible? Mm -hmm. I have a question. So there's two ways to do this. The first one is that there's no estimator that of sigma that differentiates the prime itself. The other one is that if you restrict yourself to actually outputting binary vectors from which you form this variance matrix, then uh, the binary vectors we are going to create are not going to be differentially part of it. Is the statement valid for both? For both, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is a very strong statement, actually. Yeah, so this is um, the differentially, actually, so maybe I'll back up. So differentially private estimator of the covariance matrix is, is possible. The estimate, sorry, the, the estimator itself is possible. It is impossible to create synthetic data. So it's impossible to create the vectors from which it is possible, but this, the metrics itself can be created. Um, one way to do this would be to, one way to do this, for example, would be to, to compute the covariance metrics, the true vectors, put some noise on top of it, and then generate Gaussian, uh, let's say Gaussian vectors with the same covariance. You, input, you output synthetic data even, but that synthetic data, the Gaussian vectors will not be in the Boolean cube. Uh, if you would like to restrict them to the Boolean cube, then you have problems. So the no-go result says that the, the soup norm is impossible, that all marginals are impossible to preserve, and what we do is the most, most marginals is okay. So if we just take, instead of infinity, instead of the soup norm, you, you take the Frobenius norm, which sums all the p-square marginals then the error will be small of p squared. p squared is how many? So this is a theorem. There exists a polynomial time algorithm that constructs differentially private data that's accurate for most marginals. Two-dimensional marginals, and we, we can generate generalize this for other metrics. This is a... Yeah, I should have square rooted it, yes. Yeah, it should, should be squared. Okay. Okay, so here is here is a kind of the proof, intuitive proof of this. How do you achieve k k anonymity? Let's say let's say let's let's try to achieve k anonymity instead of differential privacy first, because it's simpler. How do you achieve k anonymity? Recall that k k anonymous is the data is k anonymous is if um, each person cannot be distinguished from at least k individuals. So what's the simplest way to do this? Just to group the people by k's, average them, and output the result. So here is here is how we this is called microaggregation. So you just group, let's say, people in 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 
let's say you have three anonymous in this picture, you have group, groups of three people, triples of people, you group them, and then you average in each group. That's microaggregation, clearly K anonymous procedure. Um, in probability terms, microaggregation is the same as conditional expectation. Just group people in threes, and this is this, the, grouping, the grouping protocol um, defines the sigma algebra, and then you just take conditional expectation. That means that you average in each of those groups. So you take conditional expectation with respect to some sigma algebra. And what do we know about it? Well, the law of total expectation says that this is unbiased estimators, expectation of X yeah. with expectation of Y. We're good in one dimensional marginals already. The law of total variance, if the variance was preserved, then we would be good in two dimensional marginals. But we know that the variance is not preserved. It shrinks, of course. So some of the variance is lost, and the law of total variance says how much. The difference between the variance is something. So something is lost. And the same thing happens in higher dimensions. Instead of variance, you have covariances, and there is low total expectation. Everything is good. The low total covariance says that something is lost uh, in in the positive semi-definite order. There is a simple formula that can be checked. Some some covariance is lost, and our goal is to know how much. Uh, in fact, we're we're trying to design the K, the estimate. We're trying to design this this microaggregation. So the sigma algebra is in our hands. So the question is, what is the best sigma algebra of given complexity, let's say generated by at most 100 sets, for which as little as possible covariance is lost? It's a general question, general probability question, very nice one. And so here's a question, how do we answer it? Okay, in one dimensions, the answer is kind of easy, very straightforward. Let's say you have one dimensional case and suppose our vector is bounded by one. In absolute value. Then how do you construct the sigma algebra in the best way? You just take this interval, the, the range of this vector, just chop it into the equal subintervals, lengths two over k, and then the resulting error will be something like two over k. If you take the conditional expectation, of course, this the, the resulting error will be two over k because the conditional expectation takes values in the same subset. Uh, so the, the how much variance is lost is two over k squared all squared, so four over k squared. So that's the answer, right? If you if you if we want a sigma algebra with k subsets, then then just chop it like this, and you get uh, the variance uh, error is four over k squared. Very nice variance. The problem with this is it doesn't generate in high dimension to high dimensions. Why? Is um, because of the curse of dimensionality. You can. So in this picture, you, we chopped an interval into k parts, and the key thing was that each of these parts has become smaller, smaller diameter. But you cannot do this in higher dimensions. If you take a ball in high dimensions, dimension, let's say 100 or something like this, and try to chop it in k parts, you will need to chop it in very many parts, exponentially many parts, until the, the diameter of the, of the pieces will decrease. Okay, that's a curse of high dimensionality. You need to chop a sphere in high dimensions into exponentially many parts in order to see the decrease in, in the diameter. And so this argument simply doesn't work because exponentially many you cannot afford on computation. Uh, so, so the question still remains, what's the best sigma algebra of a given complexity, which is generated by k sets for which, um, for which the covariance degrades as, as little as possible? Fortunately, this, is, this still can be done. So we can still overcome the curse of dimensionality, although in a very, very bad way, but really is like log K thing. But this is, this is at least you can prove this. This is a dimension-free result that we proved and it says that if X is a random vector, let's say normalized, so this norm is at most one, almost surely, then there exists a sigma algebra generated by K sets, K is arbitrary, for which the covariance loss which is a, the, the error in the covariance matrix is at most this. So log k is not a, probably is not what you would hope for, but, I, but it is, it's actually optimal. So one thing is to, to look, to think about this, this theorem. One thing is that it immediately gives you k, uh, k anonymity because microaggregation is k, is k anonymity. So that it gives you k anonymity with a little, with, 
a little more work, you can upgrade this to differential privacy. That's what we do. So this is a differential private data. Um, the bound, surprisingly, is dimension free. So not only it does not suffer from high dimensionality, it doesn't suffer from any dimensionality, actually. So there is no, there is no dim dimension dependence here. It's, it's, uh, it's a low, it's a very weak decay, but it is optimal. And the, the root of log log k factor was just very recently removed. Uh, so you can improve it and get rid of the log factor. And this is a result that's optimal up to a constant. We stated this result for two dimensions, but really you can extend it to higher dimensions. There is a almost like a mirror. I didn't know this. I don't know. Did you know this result that the um, the uh, inequality about tensors that they've never heard about is that the error extends automatically to higher order margins. So in this inequality down there, if you it says that if if um, if you can control the two dimensional marginals that you Two-dimensional errors you automatically control higher dimensional errors up to some constant. Yes, yeah, X needs to be um, bounded by one with this normalization because otherwise there is homogeneity problem. But with that, yeah, that's true. It doesn't hold for any X and Y. It holds for X and Y, which is the conditional expectation of X. So it's not true for any random vector X and Y. So this is an automatic upgrade and you get this covariance loss generally. Good. So this is this this was number one result about the uh, that says that although we cannot preserve all covariances, we cannot release private data that preserves all covariances, we can release data that preserves 99% of these covariances. Sorry. Good. The second topic will be about, about releasing more than just covariances, basically any Lipschitz function. So as of now, when people do some work in differential privacy and, and try to release some synthetic data, it, the guarantee are for fixed set of queries, for example, marginals. So people construct the, the private data and say, okay, we guarantee that Covariances will be okay. Landing in percent covariances will be okay. Or we guarantee that you can do this regression on variable 17 on the other variables. But we do not guarantee the clustering, for example, or something like this. So how is it even possible to conceive a method that guarantees more than that? Then that would be kind of ignorant to, to, the, um, to what questions will be asked in the future. For example, will be true for any clustering or classification or all kind of regressions or something like that. Is it even possible to efficiently construct differential private synthetic data that is accurate for wide range of queries? And you do not know which queries in advance. So you do not pre-design your, your data for the specific query. So that's that's the next question. And we will ask, and we'll try to ask it as a as a mathematical problem that we'll call private measure problem. So here's a little bit more general setup. Suppose our true data uh, lives in a metric space, for example, Boolean cube was Hamming distance, but any metric space really. And we would like to, to construct a differentially private algorithm that transforms the true data, which is again, N patients in, in this metric space into synthetic data, which is M patients in this metric space, so that the accuracy is good. And for this accuracy, we'll, the accuracy will be measured with Wasserstein distance. And I'll explain why. So first, what is Wasserstein distance? You look at the empirical measure of the true data, empirical measure of synthetic data, really the measures that assign mass one over M and one over M. And then you couple these measures in the best possible way. So you basically match the patients, it's the true patients with synthetic patients in the best possible way. And you would like this error to be smaller. Uh, the, the Wasserstein metric measures the average distance, average matching distance, the, the true data, being matched with synthetic data. So for example, if the Wasserstein distance is less than delta, that means that you can match the true to synthetic data by traveling at most delta on average. So this, it's really is about adding noise. Really. So you, you construct, can we can, you construct the synthetic data by adding noise of average order delta to the true data. 
but you don't require the synthetic noise to be IID, for example, or some random or some flavor. Some noise. So can we generate some kind of noise? That, that, so that's what Wasser scientists is about. Okay. Now we need to think about what is the, what would the possible result be? What is the, like a theoretical? What is the theoretical um, best way you can do this? The ac optimal accuracy cannot be better than the average spacing between the points between because for the privacy attempts to confuse points between each other so you would like these points to travel across each other to get confused and the average spacing in the cube on, on the interval is one over n and on the cube is n to the minus one over d if d is the dimension of the cube if you just put random points and the average average spacing average distance between them is n to the power minus one over d so that would be the best possible thing can we do this that's 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 a result. That's so that's a question. Another thing why we ask about Wasserstein distance and about nothing else is that the duality result, the duality characterization of Wasserstein. Kontrovich Rubinstein, Rubinstein duality theorem says that if the Wasserstein distance is less than delta, then all possible Lipschitz queries will be answered approximately correctly, and this is a formal result. Too. So if we if we if we are accurate with respect with respect to Wasserstein, then the synthetic data will be accurate for any Lipschitz query, and we do not know we do not need to know which query in advance. So that's that's why it's so useful. And uh, here is and here is what we how can, we can do this. First, you can just add noise, but if you add noise, then the accuracy will be bad, and the accuracy will be bad because the noise kind of adds together. And the noise accumulates. You would like to prevent the accumulation of the noise. How can we do this? Um, I'll just say something like this. The noise, when it accumulates, let's say in a, in a simple random walk, it accumulates at the rate n to the power one half. But when it accumulates, and, and we would like it to cancel. So basically, the, all, all of this problem reduces to finding a way to cancel noise in a simple random walk is to design a, a kind of a super regular random walk with, where noise cancels better than the Brownian motion. And this is this is the result that we have. So it's a super regular random walk. So there is there is a random walk on in Rn which whose potential whose whose density is like a Brownian motion e to the minus v of z, where v is a potential. For, for Brownian motion, it will be z square over two. Gaussian. But here we say it's something. Uh, it's regular. So it's Lipschitz in the one norm. And the, the random walk that it generates is canceling noise better than the, uh, than the Brownian motion. So for Brownian motion, the right-hand side will not be locked to the fourth. It would be n, the variance of the standard Brownian. And here we're saying we can we can reduce n to log to the fourth while keeping the other property of the Brownian motion, which is regularity of the potential. That was very surprising. So, yeah. Okay. So that's that's um, that's the theorem, which in yeah, this is a uh, let me let me just show you the ultimate result is that, that there is a private measure. So what when we use this. This, this uh, uh, random walk, we just, uh, the, the, uh, the ultimate consequence of this is that there is a, a differentially private synthetic data with this accuracy, one over n to the one, which is, which is optimal actually. So, so there are many open questions in this area, is to, to extend this to other metric spaces, is to, to think about what actually the biggest problem is to, is to define something else other than differential privacy. To do, to, to quantify privacy in some other way. For practitioners, differential privacy may be too hard thing to achieve. Utility still suffers, but we, we don't know how. Hmm? 
yes, yeah, it's it's very constructive. You just add noise. Let's so you you take the metric space. Let's say the cube. You chop it into little parts as if you were micro aggregating, so little subcubes. And to each part, you you perturb it with this. Uh, uh, you perturb. Let's say if you perturb them with IID noise, that will be the Brownian motion thing, and the noise will be too much. But you perturb it with this random walk, and that will be. And the random walk is constructive. It's just a standard. It's it's a variant of the standard Levy construction of Brownian motion. So that's that's constructive. Very good question. Yes, yeah, so we uh, briefly it is you first do the dimension reduction on the space. So you, you would like first to do something like a Johnson linear Schaus, and you want to reduce the dimension until the point where you have low dimension, and low dimension everything is okay. It's like for the interval. So it's, it's no problem for, for, for just doing the standard partition. The problem is what you do with the uh, with the kernel because the kernel is so large, and that that is something that you, you can uh, you, you need to find in a smarter way. But really, it's dimension. It's it's it's, it's, it's a smart dimension reduction, and then it does, it's done. Yeah. Yeah, why why not release covariance? That's that's exactly that's right. The, the second part of this talk actually answers it because you 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 would like to have something more than just covariance. Uh, you would like to release a synthetic. You you would like to reduce the amount of interaction between you between let's say the hospital and the uh, the company that does the synthetic data. Because if then the synthetic, if the hospital says, I would like them to do this clustering. And then you say, okay, my data wasn't actually meant for clustering, it only meant for covariance. So let me re, you know, redo the data for you, regenerate the data. That's what we want to avoid. We'd like to release something and then go play with it. Just you know, do any queries you like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.